Welcome back to the Dallas Prospect. Last night, the Dallas Mavericks did not clinch a return trip to the NBA Finals. They did not complete the sweep of the Minnesota Timberwolves. Now let's talk about what went wrong in Dallas's 105-100 defeat last night at the AAC. There were some challenges coming into this game right off front. We knew that Derek Lively was out. Although we do hear from Ali LaForce that now that there will be a Game 5, he is likely for Game 5. Although I will add a caveat, you saw him more than once on the bench, kind of stretching the neck with a little bit of grimace. He's not 100%, and they're going to do everything they can to have him ready. But I still, while on one hand I say if you had him healthy, like not injured, if you'd had him in the game last night, this is a double-digit Dallas win. Can't convince me otherwise. His rebounding, his defensive disruption, his ability to protect the rim. I know how many blocks Gafford had. Gafford is playing his absolute best he can. But one, the lack of having the two-headed monster. And two, the fact that Lively is simply a better paint defender, more versatile defender than Gafford is really putting Dallas in a tough spot. Minnesota wasn't able to adjust fast enough in game three when Lively went out to really properly take advantage of his absence. But with some additional game planning and time, knowing he was not going to play game four, they came out and they made solid adjustments that made a big difference. They actually won the points in the paint battle by double digits, and that was huge. Again, we'll get into all of this. Lively should be back game five. I'm just going to say... That being the case, I'm tempering expectations. You also welcome Maxi Kleba back into the mix last night after he missed several games with a uh, separated AC joint. It was his left shoulder, actually. Well, left is over here. I had it right the first time. I was thinking the mirror approach here for what you see. But he returned to action and, you know, he gave you what you could, what you could hope for. He's not going to be good shooting threes right now. He said he just started shooting threes again the other day in practice and that it still doesn't feel great, whether he's talking about physical discomfort. Again, it's his left shoulder, not his right, but that's still your guide arm. You're still having to raise it up over your shoulder, you know, your, your arm over shoulder elevation. So if you have a separated joint, your collarbone, that's going to affect that. All of that has to be taken into consideration. But... Even that being the case, he still gave you something. And it's good to get him back in the mix. I think he's going to play a vital part in this one way or another, whatever it results in. For me, the real question becomes, how was Dallas going to take Minnesota's potentially last great punch? Now, I say potentially because if you had handled your business, this would have been it. Instead, you didn't. Minnesota was playing wild Frankly, reckless. They racked up a lot of fouls. And Dallas, while they did a good job getting some of those guys in foul trouble, they didn't take advantage to close the door. They didn't foul out any of Minnesota's guys, even though you got five fouls on Rudy Gobert, five fouls on Carl Anthony Towns. You got five fouls on Carl Anthony Towns with five minutes to go in the third quarter. And he's who torched you. Now, Anthony Edwards as well. But he's who torched you. Cat finally woke up in the second half, and particularly... In crunch time, he started raining threes. He hit four or five threes last night, had 20 points in the second half, and he was the difference. He finally showed up and made a difference for Minnesota in this series. And it's just, it feels like if you're Dallas, how did you not attack him? How did you not go after him? Again, five fouls with five and a half minutes left in the third quarter. I understand he sat for a while after that. But when he's coming back and making an impact, you got to go at the man. You got to you gotta be desperate to get that foul on him, especially after he's already knocked down two or three threes. So Dallas had its opportunities, but they didn't capitalize. Anthony Edwards had f four fouls as well. Um, they had several guys from Minnesota in foul trouble. And Dallas, it's like they would put them in that position, but then they would kind of dial back. They wouldn't really go for it. And the thing is, with those guys in that position it's usually not going to be a tic-tac foul on that stage that gets them out. That's not to say it never does or that there's no precedent for it, but you got to you gotta make them earn it. You're not going to get it with a bump or something like that in a pick and roll because there were times where Dallas was playing like, hey, we drew contact. Where's the foul? 
And it's like, no, 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 no. You got to play tougher than that. You got to go through that. You have to make it irrefutable what happened in these cases. And Dallas just didn't take advantage of it. So you lost the rebounding battle. Again, huge for Lively there, especially that offensive glass. Uh, And you lost the points in the paint. You did shoot the three better than them. Although if you look at your three best players, your three best offensive players here, this is really going to explain it. You had the combination of Kyrie Irving, Luka Doncic, and I'm even going to add in P.J. Washington in there, shooting at just a poor clip. Luka, Kyrie, and P.J. combined to go 16 of 52. That's 25% overall. And 7 of 26 from 3. That's 26.9% overall. They also committed, between the three of them, 8 turnovers. Keep in mind, all of that, and the Mavericks not having Lively, and the Timberwolves shooting 52.7% from the field and 45.8% from three, and Dallas still only lost by five points. But here is where I caution you. Here is where I just keep trying to tell people, don't make assumptions, don't take things for granted. There's a reason I have said every step of the way, I refuse to look forward. When people ask me specifically about like the Boston finals matchup, I'm like, We'll get there when we get there. We'll have, if we handle our business, we'll have a full week before we got to talk about that. We'll have 10 days before we got to talk about that. Well, now we got even longer, so we'll see how long that ends. But you have to handle your business. Kyrie Irving said before the game, this is their Super Bowl, their being Minnesota. To us, this is just another game. Well, Kyrie Irving was 14-0 and in closeout games in his career. He got his first loss last night, and... Kyrie was kind of an absent man in this game. Minnesota made some good adjustments. I'm not going to say that they were strategic adjustments. They worked in the case of that game. If you want to talk about it in the series overall, do I think that this is like, oh, this is what they needed to do all along, or this is where they turned the series? I don't know, because what they did was they put Anthony Edwards on Luka, and they put Jade McDaniels on Kyrie. Now, that's a better option to guard Kyrie, And Kyrie was a no-show kind of in the fourth quarter and crunch time. In fact, he had a huge turnover in a one-possession game with about 48 seconds left. That kind of ended it for Dallas. I know they, they kept things sort of interesting for a minute there, but that kind of ended things where it was at. Even with that being the case, Anthony Edwards, he doesn't have the size of like Lou Dort, but he can play closer to that style of defense on Luka as like Lou Dort was able to do. So he's not he's not the defender that McDaniels is, but the physicality he was able to play with did enough to kind of throw Luca off his game for a minute. Now, when you say like, oh, Luca off his game, you just mean crunch time because this is the first game that Minnesota had it in the crunch. Their two guys showed up in the crunch and Dallas's guys, they did enough to keep it interesting, but they weren't able to make the plays that close things out. So looking at this here, Let's run through this. Kyrie Irving had 16, 2, and 4 on 6 of 18 shooting, including 1 of 6 from 3. He had 4 turnovers. He looked at times uncomfortable out there in the fourth quarter. Even when he had space, he had had enough struggles in the game that he looked like he was kind of running from those opportunities. Now, he still, in some cases, was able to make something else happen. That's great. But we need offensive aggressor Kyrie Irving, especially if we're going to talk about that closeout record. Cool, we need the closer. Where are you? That's fine. I'm not going to sweat it. I don't care about the fact he's 14-1 and now other than the fact that the one had to come on my team. I look at this and I say, cool. Dallas had won like five straight postseason games. They had a full head of steam. Everybody was finally buying in. They needed to be humbled because I firmly believe that if Dallas hadn't hadn't lost last night, if they had won, game one of the finals was probably going to be Dallas finally getting humbled. Now, again, I'm not looking that far ahead, but I think this team's confidence, they needed to be checked a little bit. They needed to be reminded, nobody thought you were going to be here. Nobody gave you a, a chance in hell of doing anything. You have to capitalize on this opportunity because if you don't, they're not going to go away. You, you've said that yourself, but saying it and feeling it and believing it aren't always the same thing. Luca had 28, 15, and 10, so he gets another triple-double, but he's 7 of 21 from the field, 4 of 11 from three. 
10 of 12 at the line again. One of those misses is, I say it's big. It was Dallas's last gasp. He, he gets an improbable and one three. I didn't honestly see the contact, but they called it. So you got to go with what you go. Um, it, they were down six. He gets this and one three with like 14 seconds left. And then the ball hangs on the rim, hangs on the rim and falls out. So that would have made it a two point game and you're playing the foul game, but you're keeping yourself in position. That would have been the last chance to really make it interesting. And it just didn't work out for Dallas. And then worse, Jason Kidd called a timeout, which then allows Minnesota not only to save their own final timeout, but then they get the half court out. They get a great inbound play where they connect with Nas Reed and he gets a bucket and that that's it. That's all she wrote. So that's, that's really the difference in this game. Um, you know, PJ Washington, he hit some nice shots here. He had 10 points, five and two hit a couple big threes in the fourth quarter. That's great. But he was only three of 13 from the field. Uh, Derek Jones Jr. had a couple threes again. Looks like he's really found a home for himself. He was nine points, five boards four assists as well. Love that. Would I would I look at here if I'm looking for two great signs for Dallas? I look at Jaden Hardy waking up and turning into something here. Jaden Hardy in 12 minutes had 13 points, five of eight from the field and a rebound. He was three of four from three. Now he's not a tremendous defender, but you see it. You see the guy's got something going here. And I still believe that even though you didn't get the win last night, getting him into the flow of this offense and making him be that spark plug off the bench is your best asset. It's the one thing that other teams can't counteract because if you got Luca and Hardy, and uh, Kyrie going, there's just nothing you're going to be able to do. There's there's nothing. It's the same conversation of when, like, LeBron would talk about playing the Mavericks if Tim Hardaway Jr. is actually on that game. Like, they got those three guys going, one of which is coming off the bench, you're done. There's there's nothing you can do because they're going to hit so many insane shots, and they're going to be, they got three guys that can go on heat checks that'll last a full game or a half game, whatever. You're just not going to be able to handle that. Jaden Hardy is that same dude, but he's better than Tim Hardaway Jr. So getting him going and getting him this growing confidence now is great. And by the way, shout out to Kid because Hardy didn't start the game great. He was 0 of 2 and had a couple defensive lapses right out of the gate. But Kid stuck with him and it paid off. Uh, this, this kid, he's got something. And so I look at that and I say, okay, there's my silver lining. The other thing I do look at is Daniel Gafford. Look, I know I just said, and I, and I stand by it. The drop off between Gaff, uh, between Lively and Gafford, as hard as Gafford is playing, he is giving everything he's got. And he is, were it not for Hardy, he would be in the conversation of best offensive centers, certainly, and one of the best centers in Mavericks history. Granted, that is a very short list. He would be in that conversation. But the drop off is massive defensively. The versatility, the, the footwork, the ability to stay with defenders off the drive, especially when you're playing out away from the basket. And yes, even the rim protection, even though Gafford ended with three blocks in the game and had some big plays, it's just different. When he's able to be your second, I know he's the starter, and some people still can't wrap their heads around that. They're like, oh, Dallas is so dumb. They got Lively coming off the bench when he's clearly the better guy. It's because they're protecting him. They're protecting him from early foul trouble. They're letting him get his first real eating, if you if you will, against largely backups or after at least the starters have been going for a while and have a little bit of fatigue to them, and he gets to come in fresh as a daisy. It's protecting the young rookie. But Gafford is the second horse in the stable. And so when he's got to play up to that level, he came through in Game 3. He incredibly came through, and that's why I made sure to make him the, the thumbnail of that post-game video because I was like, no, man, this is to me, this is Gafford. We know what Luka and Kai are going to do until they didn't in this game, but... That's why I wanted to give Gafford that love, even just in that small, very symbolic way. He fought hard here. You could see he was physically drained. He gave everything he had, but the drop-off is different because the way that Minnesota is now attacking the paint and getting there, Anthony Edwards getting going is because he is suddenly able to get to the basket almost at will. Now, he doesn't have the same clip of hitting shots that like SGA had, where SGA would be like, my God, does this man ever miss? He doesn't have that same presence, but SGA going against Gafford, we saw what that looked like in the last round. They were Gafford was a minus 69, I think, in the series 
Lively was a plus 71. Teams are going to be able to get at the Mavericks interior if Gafford is the only thing manning it. Now, when Gafford's able to be in there uh, amid everything else they got, he'll get you those blocks. He has incredible athleticism. His ability to get that max extension block, including he had two back-to-back on Carl Anthony Towns that were just incredible. Um, Walked one out of bounds, then on an inbounds pass, got again a fingertip on it to block him at the rim right after that on the inbound play. Just incredible, incredible. Dallas created their opportunities, but they also had a lot of opportunities to seal the deal, and they just couldn't. Gafford in 31 minutes, 12 points, 8 boards, 6 of 6 from the field, 3 blocks, and a steal. He was still a minus 1 in the game. Uh, Anthony Edwards, 29, 10, and 9, near triple-double from him, 11 of 25 from the field, 2 of 5 from 3. If he had a weak spot in his game, he was 5 of 8 from the foul line. Really, to me, that's a significant thing, too, because free throws is one of those areas where you had opportunity. Minnesota shot poorly. They were 16 of 25 and one. It was their game for free throw shooting performance, sort of. Obviously, uh, 46 or 64 percent from the line is better than what Dallas had against OKC game four. But it kind of felt like that. It felt like the reason that Dallas is here and in this position is because Minnesota has 14 turnovers. Dallas still committed 13, by the way, but they had 14 turnovers and Dallas's points off turnovers was like more than 30. They were lethal in making Minnesota pay for their turnovers. So that mixed with bad free throw shooting from Minnesota and the fact that Dallas shot the ball better from three, 14 of 40, 35 percent. I say better from three. It it wasn't better from three because Minnesota ended up 11 of 24 uh, for 46 percent. So Dallas had more makes but worse percentage. All of this to me felt like the opportunities were there for Dallas, but they couldn't quite get it done. Minnesota won on the, on the boards, not the offensive glass, but they won 40 to 38 overall six offensive boards compared to 10 for Dallas. I was honestly surprised that Dallas still had 10 offensive rebounds, even without lively, because there were times where just the way that lively is able to get into plays, even on like, miss shots the way he's able to at least be in there and be a threat and how he makes Minnesota have to like scramble in every sense anyone scramble in every sense uh compared to when uh, Lively's out there excuse me when Gafford's out there it's just not the same it's not the same level so something to keep an eye on there uh Minnesota also got 13 and 10 out of Gobert four or five from the field he was how many blocks did he have Wow, amazingly, no, he had one block. He had one block. Um, 10 out of McDaniels, 14 out of Conley. Conley played some big minutes for them. And uh, Cat, 25 points, 9 of 13 from the field, 4 of 5 from 3. So that was that was it. That was your difference of the game because their bench gave them very little. They had 2, 6, and 6 off the bench, 14 points. Nas Reed did nothing to you in this game, and you still weren't able to get it done. So that's why I say... Take take this loss, use it as a wake-up call. While you can look at it and say, hey, I am confident in the ability of Luka, Kyrie, and PJ to come back and bounce back and not have that kind of game again. Well, Minnesota was desperate. Minnesota changed how they threw a lot of things at you overall last night. The way they blitzed you, the way that they fought, I thought for the first time all series really over the screens of Dallas and not just almost conceding ground on some of these screens to get Dallas these shots that they were getting was different. They found something that at the very least made Dallas have to work that extra little bit harder. And to their credit, or Dallas's lack of credit rather, their blame, I guess, they weren't able to do that. So Luca, yeah, he can take accountability for the loss after the game. Honestly, I would like to hear Kyrie say the same thing um, because I felt like he was MIA in closing time. And... You know, Luca was he was out there and he was doing his thing. He made some plays, but then he would counteract that with a couple misses or again, not converting at that foul line. Everybody has a share in this and overall Dallas's execution just wasn't quite where it needed to be to get this job done. The chance was there, but they didn't get enough out of it. And it's very interesting to me that Dallas's defense is still damn, damn good. And yet, the difference of this defense with Lively off the floor versus on the floor. 
is staggering. This defense to me might be the best in the league when Lively is on the floor right now. When it's not on the floor, they're still a very good defense, but the di- the dimensions of it are significantly different. Like this is a, a top 10 defense without him. With him, it's maybe the top one or two. It's in that department. That department, that sound, that's a weird way of putting that. It's in that stratosphere. Sounds better. So there's some things to take into this. Anthony Edwards, great closer down the stretch. Uh, like I said, their duo finally outplayed Dallas's duo in crunch time. Finally put the blemish on Kyrie Irving's postseason closeout game resume. I'm still going to look at the positives and say Jaden Hardy's emergence is huge for Dallas. I'm also going to go out on a limb and say, you know, if you look at Luka's postseason history, the man does play better on the road. And there's two reasons for that, I think. And I'm not the first person to say this. I saw somebody kind of on a similar train of thought. Um, oh man, who was it? I was trying to think of the Twitter handle. It was like something Jericho, maybe. I, I forget. But Luca at home, I don't know if it's that he complains more or less at home. But I do think Luca feeds on the crowd for better and worse. When the crowd is behind him, it's almost like when he has a complaint on a play, he's almost like, ah, see? Like, it seems like he's hanging on to things more at home. Whereas if he's on the road, the crowd sees him complain and they're shitting all over him. Luca sucks, chance, uh, whatever, trash talking him, and it shifts his focus. So he goes from a place of like, complaining and frustration like oh ref how did you miss that or there's no way i did that no no you're mistaken you missed that or are you even watching whatever to oh i'm sorry what was that what did you say all right bet you're dead i'm, I'm about to you you poke the bear i'm about to go destroy you that is the different mentality for luke on the road and if you look at his stats he has performed better on the road in his in his career in, in his postseason career so luca Coming off of a game in which he did not close. Dallas, a chance to close, falling up short. It's the third time in a row. Now, I could look, I I understand closeout games, they closed out in game six both times, one game five and then one game six. So it's not like the chance to close out the series and failed. But it's the third series in a row that I found myself saying they should have closed that out a game earlier. They should have won the first two game, first two series in five. Because in both times, they dropped game four uh, in in a fashion where they either scaled the mountain, got themselves into position to finally win it, and then just didn't execute. Or, on the other side of it, they pissed it away at the end in the OKC game four. Last night was their chance to do it yet again. So this is the third time. Now, the good news. They have responded every time very well. What's more? They've also responded even when they had to go on the road to do it. Because both of those game fours obviously led to game fives on the road. Dallas won both of those. So that is something to keep in mind. But I hesitate to say, hey, they'll shoot better. Their track record says they'll shoot better. Yeah, well, their track record said that Kyrie was 14-0 in closeout games and that Jason Kidd uh, in closeout games was also unbeaten. Luca in closeout games, his stat lines, godly. It only takes one. You let Minnesota up off the mat. Now, they're staggering. They're not like up, up, but they're, they're on their feet, and they're stumbling, getting their feet back under them. If you fuck around, and I don't drop many F-bombs on the channel anymore, but every now and then one will slip out. If you F around and don't handle your business in game five, bet series is on. Reset everything series is on because Minnesota is a team that's built on an us against the world thing. And I think to some extent, when they knocked off the Nuggets and they became the favorites that everybody was looking to, I think it kind of got in their head a little bit. They felt like they slayed the dragon. They didn't come out with the same intensity. Now, Dallas did a lot of things. Dallas deserves every ounce of credit they got for going up 3-0 the way they did. But I think Minnesota 
kind of had a, a viewpoint of like there there's a difference here. I didn't have the vitriol in this series that I had for for the Clippers or even the Thunder. And again, the Thunder is kind of like a secondary satellite team for me in terms of casual fandom. I didn't have that feeling for the Timberwolves. But likewise, I don't think the Timberwolves had that feeling for them. They hated Phoenix. They hated them. They swept their ass and they couldn't stand them. You could tell they wanted to destroy them, to annihilate them. Then they go to war with the champs. They were built for that matchup and they got them. And then it's like, okay, here comes Dallas. And now we're the favorites. We're the ones everyone expects to do something. And it just felt like they didn't have the same fight and urgency in them. That, you know, after game three, Anthony Edwards in the locker room apparently is saying like, well, here we are. Now we got to go out and make history, basically. Like, I'm paraphrasing that, but that was the idea. Like, all right, now we got to go be the one. And the way that you be the one is to get that first one. They got the first one, and they got it on our floor. So now the series pivots back to Minnesota, to Minneapolis. And uh, you got to, if you're Dallas, you got to respond because some adjustments Minnesota did make worked. Do I think they work in the long term? No. No. Because I still saw a lot of Luka picking apart the defense, seeing things clearly. But the shakeup in the matchups did at least somewhat bother the Dallas offense. And I think that led and lent itself to Kyrie's struggle overall in that game. And Luka, you know, Luka, I don't know how much of it was just him kind of being gassed or him just being back in the case of having to deal with the physicality again, being a little bit thrown off. But it lent itself to Dallas not being able to rise up and just destroy in crunch time. Just looking here through some of my notes. I mean, we, Dallas was right there every step of the way. Uh, they were tied at the half 49 all despite shooting 10% worse um, from the field. They were down two or four going into the fourth quarter. Maybe it was five. I think it was five, actually. And I just didn't really feel that, I didn't feel that concern because the history we had seen, I was like, okay, they've, they've hung around, they've done it. And we know this team is built to pull away at the end. And yet, that's not what we got because crunch time showed up and it was the Timberwolves who answered the call and not the Mavericks. Now they made some great plays late. Uh, Daniel Gafford's reverse dunk off the Kyrie feed, beautiful. His defense, beautiful. Dallas had several great runs in this game offensively. But they just couldn't capitalize. Minnesota made so many over-aggressive plays, so many dumb fouls. They put themselves in bad spots. They turned the ball over. They failed to convert at the foul line. Everything was there, I felt like, for Dallas with its experience and its composure to rise above. But push came to shove. Crunch time showed up. And for the first time, it was Minnesota who answered the bell. Here, oh, here's that Anthony Edwards quote. Time to make history, fellas. We're here now. So I basically said the same thing. I just flipped it accidentally. Yeah. I'm not gloom and doom. I'm not somebody who's going to stress and be like, oh, no, what are we ever going to do here? But I will tell you this. If you're Dallas and you don't take this as a complete wake up call I don't know what to tell you because you're just leaving yourself vulnerable this Wolves team has no quit they're not smoke and mirrors this is not a team that's just happy to be here they're a team that for years was trounced in a joke made this run to get here to this stage and right as everybody started to believe in them got their asses humbled and they are on the cusp of being dismissed again. Now, people, no one's questioning their future and what they're going to be, but what those players see is everybody, right as they started to believe in us, they found the reason to revert back to their previous viewpoint and assume that we're nothing, that we're not going to do anything, that we're going to fade away like the wolves always do. F them. We're going to go get this one. And we're going to be reckless doing it. We're going to be desperate, fighting, clawing every step of the way, maybe detrimentally so at times, but we're going to go out there and get it. That was how they attacked this game, and Dallas did not capitalize on it. They were right there. They were right there, ready to, to put an end to their season, 
and they just didn't execute when it came down to it. So a lot to take away from this here. Overall, overall, I'm going to say there's some good if you're Dallas, but there's also some needed attention to detail. We'll see what they're able to do here on this next matchup because game five Thursday night in Minnesota is going to be very, very interesting, especially now that the Celtics are going to get an even greater advantage in terms of rest. The Celtics, by the way, when you adjust the record of their opponents based on injuries, the Celtics in their run didn't have to be a team that was better than 35 and a half wins. Again, that's adjusting for injuries based on the players that in those matchups with their opponents, the players they were missing. It's staggering how untested they are. I don't care how many games it took them to play. They didn't have to go against that. If, if you had the struggles in crunch time, now you still went out 4-0 over the, the Pacers, but whoever comes out of the West, I'm going to put it that way because, again, I'm not trying to look ahead. Whoever comes out of the West is going to be battle-tested. Whether they got enough bullets in the chamber left because Boston is still a good team no matter what, we'll see. But Boston's going to have just a little bit of extra rest now, a greater advantage over that. The final start on June 6th, whether you won it last night and had you know your 10 days, whatever, uh, or whether or not you wrap up your series after Game 7 and you get just a couple days rest, whatever the case may be, Boston is going to have that much greater of an advantage now going in. Oh, hey, I found that tweet. That was uh, Jericho uh, at Kyrie Mavs, who had that kind of parallel thinking I was talking about with Luca on the road. They also point out that uh, Minnesota fought hard through screens for the first time in this series. They realized they were getting crushed in drop coverage and blitz coverage, so the only adjustment they could make was to fight through every screen and force the officials to make a decision. Okay, if that's the only counter they got, then if you're Dallas, now you know how you have to adjust. No officiating crew wants to call 20 fouls on a team fighting through screens, so they let them play on both ends. And he points out this was a great adjustment by Finch and Minnesota. I agree. Minnesota, backs against the wall, great coach in Finch, made solid adjustments. And we've talked about it before. Kid has historically done better when he's making adjustments to what the other team is doing. So maybe now that they finally found something that was beating what Kid had, maybe the coaching staff can get together and figure out an adjustment to effectively combat this in game five. Let's see here. Any other closing notes here? This is just a funny note. This was actually a note from I took from before the game yesterday. The Mavericks were scoring coming into last night 110.6 points per 100 possessions with Rudy Gobert on the floor and 135.1 points per 100 possessions with Gobert off the floor. Why is that significant? Because as Minnesota has been trying to figure out how to counter what Dallas is doing, one of the main discourses has been just taking Gobert off the floor. But Dallas has actually victimized them even more with that. So the fact that they're torching them on both fronts, but the one thing that people are saying like, well, that's the answer. If you want to roll with that, go for it, fam. Now, obviously, Minnesota didn't. But uh, I do think it's interesting to see those numbers presented that way because I wouldn't have thought it would be that drastic of a difference. I would have thought Minnesota... Um, would be maybe slightly better with him off the floor and apparently not. No shows the casual thing. If you're not really looking and in, going into the deep analytics of it, uh, your perception, your eyes don't always tell you the story if you don't know what you're looking for specifically. So that's all I got for this video. Drop a like, leave a comment below, subscribe to the Dallas prospect. Let me know. Do the Mavericks handle their business in game five? Does Kyrie bounce back? Does Luca bounce back? Have the Mavericks finally gotten Jaden Hardy going? And is he going to be a difference, ma uh, difference maker in this deciding game five? Let me know in the comments. Until next time, guys, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace.